Well, good morning again, family. I'll turn this on. The Lord is risen. Well, this time, Easter, we often talk about the uh, historical reality and the theological importance of the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and we read those passages, like Laura read this morning, about the women going to the tomb, and we believe that this happened, that's a historical fact, and that it's an ultimate truth. Today we're going to read a different passage from Paul and, and look at it, talking about that ultimate truth lived out in our lives, our Easter. And listen carefully as Miho comes and reads this passage to us. Since then, you have raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to live in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another, with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Thank you, Mio. Heavenly Father, we appeal to the mercy that sent Jesus to earth. We appeal to the power that raised him from the dead to allow us to receive from you because we can receive nothing unless it's granted from your hand. So we pray that you meet us here for the glory of Christ, which is our good in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said, the passage in question calls us to our resurrection. Indeed, the whole of the Easter message is echoed in the call to people through Jesus. And so it's not enough to preach the historical reality and the theological importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and then leave and live like Jesus isn't really there, like his resurrection isn't relevant. Instead, it needs to be our mindset. It colors our perceptions and our practices. And the character of Jesus can and should become our controlling influence. And that's a choice we make. So, do we choose a resurrected self or a religious system? Our passage begins. We're going to go through this big passage all together again. If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Now, of course... 
principle of biblical interpretation. You've heard it here before in your King James. It'll say, if ye therefore be risen with Christ, or if then. Obviously, he's echoing a prior argument. Just like John was saying, we really need to read big passages of Scripture. So we're going to back up a little bit. He's, Paul was dealing here in this passage with early forms of Gnosticism, most of the scholars believe, and with Judaism. People that wanted to carry forward the Mosaic law with its rites and rituals and rules into New Testament Christianity and cause Gentile people to adhere to all those feasts that were fulfilled in Christ. He was also fighting with this Gnosticism which said the physical world is bad and the spiritual world is good and the two are separate. And it led to two approaches. One was don't worry about anything you do in the body because it's of no significance. So you could indulge in anything you wanted physically and it didn't really matter. The other extreme that Gnosticism took people to was deprive the body, starve it, be a aesthetic. I always, somebody pointed out to me, I always said to say that word wrong. An ascetic, just live in humiliation of the body. Some of your translations will say that in this passage. Humi because the physical is bad, two kind of opposite approaches came from the same idea, which wasn't the idea Christ came to present. So Paul is, is tackling kind of all three of these strains, we believe. So he says, back just over your page in Colossians 2, beginning at 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. Those Old Testament rituals, they were a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. God had something else in mind when he sent Jesus. God had something else in mind all along. Not a, not a physical nation, but a holy nation extending across all people groups, united in the person of Jesus Christ. And we, we carry on in Colossians 2. If, Christ, if in Christ you died to the elemental spirit, some translations say the basic principles of the world, why then, as if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. And we know the rabbis had piled on to Old Testament law, fences outside of fences, outside of fences, outside of fences. Christianity has at times done the same thing. And he says they're human precepts and teachings. Continuing on, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism or humiliating the body through rough living and severity to the body, but they have, listen to this, no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You see, a religious system brings about a bunch of rules we can try with, a bunch of practices we can go, hoops we can jump through, but he says it has no value in getting to the heart. The heart needs Jesus. The heart needs a resurrected life. And so it leads to wrongdoing. You will remember from the Old Testament prophets, if you've read some Old Testament prophets, you will remember from... Jesus and his interaction with the scribes and Pharisees. He says, you guys are missing the point. You guys are not looking after the foreigner and the widow. You're not carrying out what God wants. Remember uh, the prophet Micah came and he said, He has shown you, O man, what's good and what the Lord desires of you. To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. He was indicting those group of people. They had their rules, their rights, but they were doing wrong. And that's what a religious system brings. Now, the, what's the alternate? The alternate is a resurrected self. 
Our passage began in Colossians 3. If ye then be risen with Christ. In contrast to that religious system with its rules, rights, and wrongdoing is this resurrected self. Look at this passage from Ephesians 1. It reflects what it means to be risen with Christ. And he's praying. He prays for them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, knowing God through the Holy Spirit, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of of him who fills all in all. Sorry, I'm reading a lot of scripture here, but in here we find our position. We have this glorious eternal hope to which he has called us. The riches of God's glorious inheritance in us. Jesus, the King of Kings, is inheriting us and it's rich. That is quite a position for us as his redeemed people to be in. And it says... Uh, Further down in this passage, it seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. In Ephesians 2, verse 6, it says, God has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. A resurrected self has a glorious position in Christ. And it says... What is the immeasurable greatness in this verse of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him. The power that raised Jesus Christ, it says, is the power at work in us who believe. Rules, rights, and regulations have no power. A religious system has no power to transform your life. But the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead has power to transform your life. It's the only, it's the ultimate power. What a difference. And it says we have purpose because he gave Jesus at the tail end of this Ephesians passage. He gave Jesus as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So when the head wants to do something on earth, what does the head do? The head moves the body, right? When the head wants to be, show his fullness, the one who fills all in all, who created the universe, when he wants to show that to our neighborhood, how does he move? The body. So we have a tremendous purpose to reflect the glory of the one who made the universe, to do the good that the head wants to do in our community, in our family, in this world is a tremendous purpose of a resurrected life. And so it is a tremendous difference between a religious system and a that is the next one. And a resurrected self. Now I, I wanted to linger on this for a second if I might. Because I think this is important. Because I said it's choosing Easter. This is one of the biggest things we have to choose and maintain. That having spoken the name of Christ, having confessed him, having realized that we are separated from God by our moral inadequacy, that Jesus paid the penalty for all moral inadequacy even though he was perfectly adequate and takes upon himself that punishment and offers his resurrection life to to us, And we can confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God rose and raised him from the dead and fall into a religious system. And so we need to choose it continually. We need to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now I brought something. I've been doing kids club for a lot of years. 
This is fantastic. It was my dad's. The guys are going, yay. This is a really big crescent wrench. It's a lovely tool. With this tool, I can use my strength to affect cool things. I can do. I can make. I can fix. And if this isn't working for you, maybe a Bernina sewing machine with automatic tension control and free motion quilting capabilities. <laughs> Substitute whatever you want, but for guys, yay. Big crescent wrench. Hmm? You, you do lots, yeah. This is a beautiful tool. I'm going to put it right there. Now, something that is often met with less enthusiasm in my life is when I bug my crew to wear them when they go forward on the barge, when I bug my nieces to wear them when we're out in the boat. Life jacket. Nobody wants to wear a life jacket. Uh, you know, a life jacket says something about you. A life jacket it restricts my movement. I don't feel free in a life jacket. I don't feel like me. It covers up my excellent fashion and my glorious body. <laughs> it, I, I feel constricted in a life jacket. Moreover, it says things about me. Often when I say to people, maybe you should put on a life jacket, they say, I'm an excellent swimmer. <laughs> or they'll say, I'm a, I know my way around boats. Or they'll say to me, don't you, what, are you a bad boat driver? Don't, don't you know how to run a speedboat? Why, why are you, right? It says something about us. Right? We feel demeaned. We don't need that. So it's obvious which is more popular. Now let me transport you to the middle of the Strait of Georgia. Land is miles away. Have you changed your mind? Who wants the wrench? Right? The decision becomes crystal clear whether we want help or whether we want our tools so we can do. Listen, when you're out in the middle of the Strait of Georgia, we spiritually, we're spiritual eternal beings. We're made to breathe the air of the presence of God. We're made to commune with the Holy God. But because of the human condition, because of human rebellion, it's like we're bobbing at sea. And a religious system is, it would be like packing that wrench. I can do this! It, it'll drag you down. It's dragged many people further and further from the life God offers. Jesus comes and says, put my life on. Take upon yourself my resurrected life. And people say, oh, that'll cover up my excellent life. I'm pretty good at this. I won't have freedom. I won't have freedom of movement to do what I want to do. And they founder in life because they choose their own system apart from the life God offers. There is nothing so freeing as the life Jesus offers when you realize that you were meant to breathe the presence of God and that Jesus' resurrected life in you brings you closer to the presence of God. Now, this ties in with a lot of our local sermons we've listened to lately and Sometimes I've even heard it. You guys preach the same thing every day. My, I think the, the proper response to that is, you're welcome. <laughs> so, so the first thing about choosing Easter, the first thing about not making it just a historical event, but a personal reality, is to say, are you going to choose the resurrected life of Jesus in you, or are you going to choose a system of your own attempts to do right? Are you going to choose rules, rights that lead to wrongdoing? So, second choice, and it's about the same choice, really, is death to self or death by sin. Continuing on in our text, the next verse, Colossians 3, 3, for you have died, he speaks to these believers, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, by the way, hidden, I don't believe he's saying it's obscured, it's secured, right? Your life is made safe with Christ in God. You have died. Listen, in order to have a resurrection, in order to have a resurrected self, we need to have a died self. We need to lay something down. Now, in the, in the passage that this is responding to, again, just over your page in Colossians 2, we read this, beginning at verse 12. And when you were baptized, 
It was the same as being buried with Christ. Then you were raised to life because you had faith in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because you were sinful and were not God's people. But God let Christ make you alive when he forgave all your sins. We practice baptism here. It's a picture of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, this translation says, You were dead because you were sinful and were not God's people. If you were reading along in another translation, it might have said, the uncir- In your uncircumcision. Of course, that was a right within Jewish society given to Abraham and his offspring that they would indicate, actually the whole family, men and women would indicate because when they allowed their boys, their baby boys to be circumcised, they were entering into the process, right? They were saying, I'm going to let my... So it was a whole family thing of saying, our males as a community have this little bit of surgery that indicates that they are different from all the rest and set aside to be God's people. And it says now, J.C. Davidson pointed this out when he preached, that that was the initiation right into the Old Covenant, the Old Testament group of people. But Jesus had something bigger in mind from before time began, that it wasn't one people group, it was the whole world having the opportunity to become one people in Christ. And that now the right of initiation is not putting off a little bit of flesh. It is all people, men and women, putting off their old self and saying, I want the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. The life I lived is worthy of death, so I'm going to bury it. The life Jesus lived is worthy of eternal life, and I'm going to lay hold of that in him. And so we symbolize that, the right of initiation, to indicate our heart's participation in the new covenant is baptism. We don't have a lot of rites here, but that is one. We go under the water, sim- symbolically dying to our old self, recognizing that our old self deserves to die. Rising up, symbolizing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, recognizing that he offers his life to be lived through us. And we do that here, and we'll do that at any time that people come forward and wish to uh, make that step and that stand. Again, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How do you live by faith in the Son of God? You set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, not on earthly things, right? You have that resurrection mindset that our text in Colossians began with. I've been crucified with Christ. People say, no, I I don't want to lay my life down. But that is true life. That life is going. That old man, that, that fallen human nature, it's all going. It's all perishing. And Jesus offers his life. And so... That is a choice we make. And so if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord, the King of our life, the one that is to take control, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10 verse 9 says, we're saved. It's that simple. And people resist. People resist laying it down. Just like they resist accepting Jesus' help around them, lifting them up when they say, I cling to something that I can do. Thirdly, and lastly, choosing my Easter is putting on Christ or poisoning our culture. And our text begins. We're picking up right where we left off here in Colossians 3 at verse 5. Now, wrap your head around this. He's just said, remember, we said it wasn't rules and rights. It wasn't do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. Those things can't save you. They have no power to curb the indulgence of the flesh, our passage said. Didn't use that word, but you remember, we just read it. Um, Now he says, okay, get to work. 
This is the tension. This is the tension. And it's a very honest tension that we live with as Bible-believing Christians. So he says, put to death, therefore, since your old man died, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to our, your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Full stop. Ooh, we hate that, talking about the wrath of God, don't we? Listen, God loves his creation. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. He hates what hurts his creation. These things listed here hurts his creation. God is not so much bullying to get his way for his personal tastes. God's tastes, righteousness is life. Sin kills and hurts people he loves. These things listed here hurt, kill, destroy. They suck the life out of people. You've seen it. I've seen it. Little by little, bit by bit along our pilgrimage, we've lived it. The wrath of God is coming because he hates what hurts his people. You used to, continuing on, we used, you used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Now, is there a confusion here? Let me share with you a, a viewpoint that I've heard on more than one occasion. It says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self. Now, I've heard it said something like this. I have to be honest. And I feel rage. I feel anger. I feel impurity. It says do not lie to one another. My honesty is integrity above all. So, how can you tell me to put it off? I act it out because I'm simply being myself. Yet Paul says it's very active. Putting some things to death and others to practice. So there's a tension in that. But setting our minds on the glory of the risen Christ, as we are instructed to do at the beginning of our passage, demands that we move towards his nature. Actively move towards his nature. And Paul has no problem appealing for action on behalf of the Christian. He doesn't say, wait until you feel inclined to love, to act, even feel. He says, do it. And choosing not to do what Christ, our life, would do when Christ, who is your life, appears. You also will appear with him in glory, we read. Choosing not to do what Christ, our life, would do is choosing death. Death of relationships. Death of communion with God. Death, death, death. And so the honest thing to do is not to trust that voice of the old man inside, but say, hey, I put that to death and choose to be like Jesus. And that's why it's important to fix our mind mm -hmm. on him. He goes on and he gets more positive. He says, put this off. Now he says to put, do some putting on. Colossians 3.10. And you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, it, renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. How are we being renewed in knowledge of the image of our creator? How did we begin? If you then be risen with Christ, set your minds on things above. Set your hearts um, on things above, not on earthly things. Right? It is a resurrection mindset. It is a choice to live as a resurrected self with our minds on Jesus that we become renewed in the knowledge and the image of our creator. 
Continuing on. Here there is no Greek or Jew, or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Unity. Equality. No race. No circumcised or uncircumcised physically. It's all something in the heart now. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. Paul says elsewhere there is neither male nor female. Christ is all. And when we set our minds on Jesus, when we elevate the discourse, those small differences become obliterated. That is a resurrection mind. That is a choice. That is Easter, the death, burial, res and resurrection of Jesus coming to bear in our lives as a living testimony, as a living fact. He carries on. It's tremendously positive. Beginning at verse 10 in Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now here is the pursuit of a resurrection mindset. One that is taken up with the exalted Jesus and mindful of the work he did for us, ever mindful of the completed work of Jesus on the cross, generates the kind of church culture that I want to be a part of, that you want to be a part of. Let's look at that church culture. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. James 4.1 says, From where do... Wars, I mean, now I've got my translations mixed up. Did I print that? From whence do wars and strivings come from among you? Come they not from your lust, which war against your memories, your, your members? Did I? I thought I, um, I thought I remembered that. And so, oh yes, quarrels and fights. That's what, uh, that's what another translation says. says uh, James 4.1. From where do quarrels and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your fallen human passions which war against your members? See? Fallen human passions, earthly desires, fleshly lusts. However your Bible translates uh, James 4.1, that's where quarrels and fights come from. Our text says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So fleshly desires create wars, create fighting, create strife, break up the unity of the body. Right? Desires for the excellence of Christ. Setting our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Remembering his compassion. Remembering his mercy. Remembering his power at work in us who believe by faith. Retunes our minds so that we don't have fleshly desires. We have desires for him. Right? When we refocus our desires on the excellent character of Christ, earthly desires melt away. And those, James says, are the source of quarrels and fights among us. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's directly tied to the beginning of this passage. Set your minds. Listen. It says set your minds on things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What are things? What's above? Isn't it Jesus himself? Aren't those things the reverberation of his excellent character? Aren't those things the glory of his presence? It's him, guys. Heaven is Jesus himself. 
It's not gold or harps or stuff, right? It's all about the excellence of Christ. Set your minds on the wonder of the almighty creator who made this beauty we've been enjoying and condescending. Making himself nothing. Taking upon himself the nature of a servant. Taking himself all the punishment that my moral inadequacy, my sin, deserved. Let's carry on and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Stop there for a minute. Let the word teach and admonish. You know I'm passionate about body ministry. Sunday nights, we've been talking about body ministry. We've said, who is a minister? Right? You are. Who's a full-time minister? You are. Christian. Right? Always serving. The word means servant, right? Always serving Jesus. Serving others in the name of Jesus. Everybody. Not one big dude and a bunch of consumers. And it, look, at this is what we have. This resurrection mindset, this choice to put on Christ, this choice to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God because we are risen with him, creates a culture where people are teaching and admonishing one another. Yes, there are gifts of teaching. I'll acknowledge that. Some have, some don't, maybe. Some, some say, you know what? I just, I'll never be up there. Some of you will be up here and you just don't know it yet, but... You know, there are, we can recognize differing gifts. The Bible tells us to do that. But it says you are admonishing one another. You have wisdom, able ministers of the new covenant. You have wisdom to share with one another. This is the culture of a resurrection mindset within the church. There's peace and there's this mutual ministry. What else is going on? Ah, as you sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now I've heard people try to break that down. I'm not going to take the time. I'm going to say all kinds of music. All kinds. Yay. Is springing up. He's saying, he's saying, a resurrection mindset. Living as if Jesus really is alive and alive in us because he is. Living by faith and Tuning our minds to the glory of the risen Christ will generate worship. Now, worship isn't just music. We know that. Just kind of using that tag right now. will generate worship in music. So I said to Thomas this morning, write some songs. I know we're all busy. But I do believe music will always be bubbling up. Bubbling up. We sing a mix here, old and new. And uh, we need new too. Yeah, absolutely. We need it to, because it's a byproduct. I believe, uh, uh, I'm reading here, it's going to happen. There's going to be peace, mutual ministry, and joyful worship all coming from this mindset. Being risen with Christ. We've laid aside our old life. We've made that choice. And um, what else will happen? Peace. Mutual ministry, worshipful music. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Deeds that represent Jesus. Words that represent Jesus. Reaching out with the truth of the gospel. But guess what? If those are unaccompanied by deeds that represent Jesus, they're going to ring hollow. So a resurrected mindset will be the body of Jesus. We'll be on this exciting mission with Jesus who didn't leave and leave the world as orphans. He left and left his body here. It's us through the power of the Holy Spirit living out. So that's going to be another byproduct of choosing a resurrection mindset of our personal Easter. Not just fact of history, fact of reality. So in conclusion, remembering that we have a choice to make. Do we want a resurrected self or a religious system? Do we want a little church, a little God on the side? Do we want uh, some practices and rituals that make us feel somewhat connected to a spiritual community? Or do we want new life in Christ, Christ's life in us? If we want a resurrected self, there can only be a resurrected self if there's a self laid down. 
if we've said, I put to death the old way. I put to death my efforts. I let go of my tools that are dragging me down. I take up his life upon me that isn't really a restriction. When I really realize what I'm made for, it's freedom. Wow, I don't have to flail. I'm floating high, lifted up by his resurrection life in me. I'm not less free, I'm more free. I'm free. I can sing when I'm lifted up by him. And one day, he's taking my feet on solid ground where I will never founder again. My future is firm in him. Right now, yeah, sometimes it feels like I'm bobbing around. My future, there is no bobbing. There is no down to be dragged to is my hope in Jesus Christ as someone who's taken him upon me. So you have a choice to make. Your stuff that drags you down, giving up. People struggle so long. I've seen people struggle for years. I've seen people ask me about the gospel and I've told them and I said, wow, that's right. I know in my heart that's true, but I'm just not ready. And I've seen them go for years like that. Co-workers, I've seen them go for years. Being dragged down and down and down because they never let go. And they never put on Jesus. They never made that choice to say, it's great to celebrate Easter, but I want my own Easter. I want to die to self and raise with Jesus. And then, in our daily lives, do we live out that mindset as if Jesus really is the risen Savior? Do we put on Christ and escape all the things that would poison our broader culture, and we see it on the news every night if you watch it, and we see it within churches. Do we set our minds on the glory of the risen Christ and say, I can forgive, because wow, look, at I've been forgiven, right? I can put up with that because wow, look at look what Jesus put up with. Jesus puts up with me. Oh, I guess this is, this is easy, right? Jesus said his yoke is easy, right? Do we allow him to be our template? It's a choice, people. And it's a choice that it's important not to put off and to make yourself.